Hi everyone and welcome to today's presentation, Get Up and Go, Why You Need Motivation in Your Life and How to Get It. My name is Nick and I'm going to be your moderator for this session. So, I would like to take this opportunity to recognise and show my deep gratitude to the traditional owners of this land, the Gulf and Jarawa peoples of Toowoomba, on which we record this webinar today, which campuses and hubs have been built and whose cultures and customs continue to nurture this land. I would like to pay my respect to elders past, present and future. Well, you would like to take notes, we'd like to let you know that today's web presentation is being recorded and you'll be sent a copy of the recording and presentation slides in the days following the webinar. Throughout the presentation, I'd encourage you to ask any questions you have, may have for attendance via the Q&A function through Zoom. There'll be time for Eric and Jay to answer your questions at the end of today's session. If you're interested in tips and strategies to help you succeed in your career and studies, we recommend that you visit USQ's social hub. This has hundreds of blogs, presentations, podcasts, and videos that contain tips and advice to help make you the most of your time at university. So it's free to access and you don't need to have a social media account or USQ student number to access any of the materials that are housed there. Also, registers and is present for any of the Beyond the Books online series webinars will go into the draw to win a pair of Beats headphones valued at eighty nine ninety five. The competition will be drawn at the end of the series in October. So if you registered ahead and are attending live today, we will already be in the draw. But if you're listening to this as a recording, I encourage you to register for any of the, our other webinars from the series to go into the draw as well. With me today is Dr. Eric Fine, who is widely respected and published senior lecturer in psychology at USQ, specializing in organizational psychology and occupational health psychology topics. Co-presenting is with Eric is Jade Edmonston, who is a USQ alumnus, Australian swimmer, entrepreneur, and successful author. Jade, I'll now hand over to you, Eric, to commence today's webinar. That sounds great. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that very much. And um, I'll just go to the first slide there that has me on it. Just if anybody here recognizes me from USQ, there's an ePrints function we have through USQ. I have some of my readings up there that are free, but I'm also on Google Scholar. So I'm always interested in seeing what people think about these topics. And um, one of the ones I've spent the most time talking about in my writing is motivation. And so that's what I was asked to present on today. When I was beginning to discuss this with Nick, I was trying to find a way to conceptualize what we're talking about. And I think the best way to think about it is if you're just in a resting state and one were to get up, say you're sitting down or even just standing somewhere and you're not doing anything, there's a force inside of you that makes you move. So this would be similar to getting up and moving out of a chair or moving around the room or interacting with people in a social situation from going nowhere. This force that's pushing you to do something, this is what we think of as motivation. It's a psychological force that makes you do things. Although, in all fairness, there's often physical components too. So if you're thirsty, you may have a physical sensation of wanting a drink, for example. Or if you're hungry and you see some food on the table, the motivation is engaging with that hunger urge. But most of the time, we're talking about things in the mind where you have some vision of something that you want in the future. And that's generally going to be psychological. It can be a social thing, getting up and talking to somebody, or it could be something about what you want internally, you know, going and picking up a book, for example, and reading about something that interests you. But regardless of, of the exact thing prompting it, a motivational force uh, does three different things. It provides a direction for what you do. So this notion of direction means it's focusing you towards some things and it's pulling you away or pushing you away from other things. It also provides this mental or psychological tension that helps you keep doing something. So if you're motivated, you would get up and move towards a certain goal or some outcome or something you're trying to reach but that tension would keep you there. You would remain moving towards that thing or that, realizing that action that is springing into life to resolve that tension. Uh, also, our motivation will provide a sense of meaning. So it helps define who we are. So if there are things that we go to all the time, 
um, if there are tensions that we look to habitually release in certain ways, this tells us a bit about who we are. So if you think about rising in the morning and getting up, what's the first thing you do when you get out of bed? I mean, some people will go brush their teeth straight away, they'll clean their teeth. Other people, they're up, um, they get dressed quickly, and they'll go sit down for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. So that first thing that you're doing in the morning, something is motivating you to do that. There may be a habit there to some extent, but habits are closely aligned with our motivation. It's true that habits can drop out of awareness, but they have to be laid down by motive patterns as well. So where does your motivation come from? Well, it comes from within you, it comes from who you are, but it also comes from the world around you. So when we're um, sitting in the world um, or standing and moving about the world, we see things in the environment. We also have uh, needs and desires within us. And there's a term in motivation theory called an affordance. An affordance simply means that out in the environment, some particular need or some particular desire can be realized. So a good example of this is that if you're a social person and you desire to have social contact when you're at work, seeing people in your workplace would be an affordance. It would provide you with a means to meet that desire or that need for social contact. But environments aren't all the same. So sometimes you, know, you may not have that ability to meet the particular social need. Uh, another need might be that in the world around you, you're interested in, in some kind of stimulation. You don't, you get bored easy. So you would say, go out to a club or you, you might go out for a drive or something as opposed to sitting quietly. Other people may seek quiet environments rather than busy or strenuous environments. If you seek a quiet environment, it would mean that you have a need or a desire for quiet and peace, for lower levels of stimulation. So that world around you can pull you to act or to not act based on those basic needs or desires that match the world. But motivation also comes out of who you are. So those needs and desires are part of um, who you are, but there's also parts of you that go beyond needs and desires. And we think of these internal pieces of the person as things that are always switched on and help create your motivation, which leads us to a question. So one of the things we were interested in, in polling is to ask this question to you as an audience, what parts of you are always switched on? In other words, what parts of you are always there to help create your motivation? And so we have personality as one option, values as another option, interests as another option, and then the notion of what you expect to happen, which is sometimes in psychology known as an expectancy. So most people answering that question would say personality, and that's a very good and reasonable answer because our personalities define our typical responses to the environment around us, but also your values would help you align your actions to the environment as would your interests. And of course, what you expect to happen is an important part of your motivation as well. So if you expect that generally what you do has an effect on the world, if you have a high self-efficacy, you would be more likely to be acting. You would be more likely to be doing something based on your motivation. Now, the next slide talks a bit about why we need motivation. And so we need motivation to change the world around us. So the first bullet here says you can't consciously make things happen. So fulfilling your basic needs requires motivation. A good example, though, I think that we can all relate to is relationships. So moving into and engaging in relationships means that you have to be uh, directed towards and engaging with other people, of course. And so you can't change the world around you 
without moving into that world and doing things through motivated action. So for example, if you want to change your life and have fulfilling relationships, that might suggest that your motivation would drive you to more frequently or more deeply communicating with people and being part of a social setting. The other thing to discuss here is the notion of who you are. So have you ever wanted to change something about yourself? Have you ever felt like, well, I need to be more fit or I need to learn things? I need to develop my professional skills to a greater degree um, or whatever it may be that you want to change about yourself. Anytime we're looking at changing something about who we are, this then requires motivation. So you need motivation to change things about yourself that you want to affect and move. And another way to think about this is to flip it around. And it's not just about gaining things that you lack, but when we think about who we are, we have to think about maintaining good things about ourselves. So this is particularly true as we age and, and get older, we can end up um, you know, having to pay more attention to our bodies and minds, for example, so that we maintain our fitness and we maintain our mental health. And there might be other good things about you that people have noticed in your life. You know, you're, you're a clever learner, you're a good student, you know, you're good with people, but all those things still need maintenance. We have to pay attention to things that we're good at. We need to keep doing them. And so motivation is necessary to keep your status quo or to um, increase and learn new things as well. Now, how do we organize our motivation? This is the other bit that's worth thinking about. And goals, goals appear as sort of the main construct or the main idea that people think about in academic literature, at least, when we talk about motivation. Goals are images that are inside of you, things in your mind that represent um, desired ends, things that you want to see happen. So you could think about this as uh, a visualization in your mind of a desired end inside you, like learning more, having an image of yourself as a different person, or something in the world. So goals can be intrinsic, so things that you enjoy doing as an end in itself. So for example, if you like music and you like playing music, if you have an instrument or if you enjoy singing, that could be an intrinsic motivation driving that. Extrinsic would be for external reasons or instrumental reasons. And so the classic example of extrinsic motivation is being paid or getting a salary for paid employment. But whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic, generally there is a goal involved, an end state or a target that you're trying to reach. And that end or target is in your mind. The other thing we should discuss when we talk about organizing our motivation is the notion of life domains or different parts of who we are. We can think of these um, as domains of goals. And so we talked earlier about goals as representations in our minds, so images in our minds of ways that we want the future to come together, ways that we want to see things be achieved in the future. So images of desired states that we want to see occur in the future. And for most people, we live across life in a variety of areas, right? So it's not just about one particular thing, such as academic achievement. At the university, it's very easy to get extremely focused on academic achievement and focused on getting high marks for your courses and developing knowledge within your specialty area and graduating. So, so within a life domain like that, you might have goals that are linked together from a smaller to a larger level. Um, but that's not all we are. Um, so there's a bulletin here that says, have you ever heard the phrase, get a life? This implies that something is missing, that you might be over-representing one area of your life. And this is um, worth thinking about because, in fact, part of the historic wisdom literature um, throughout most cultures talks about this notion of having goals across multiple life domains. So it's not just about you know, having an income or having a profession or having a job or having kind of 
some, some occupation, but life is about your relationships. And those relationships would be with close, uh, significant people in your life, your family, significant people that you're involved with. Those relationships might be broader. They might be part of a larger social group. Okay, but there's also other life domains that we would want to think about, such as health and well-being for yourself and for other individuals. So this notion of having different domains or different parts of life is really critically important in goals because it seems from a psychological perspective that <clears throat> people can end up running into problems if they have a limited set of goals. And this leads us to another question, which is, would it be possible for people to neglect their life? And in what ways do people actually neglect their life? No pull. So there are several, and a couple of answers to that question may be that people neglect their health, or people get so focused on their work that they neglect the personal relationships around them, um, or they become hyper-focused on other things and neglect work. So it's possible, I suppose, for people to get very focused on relationships at one particular time and let their work life wither, or they might get focused on particular relationships within a larger group of relationships, or they might get focused on a particular type of work task in a larger number of work tasks. So we can neglect um, areas of our life kind of across areas, between areas, such as neglecting your relationships for the sake of your work, or we can neglect things within an area, like we might have one part of our work life that we focus on and neglect others. And so one way to track this is to pay attention to your goals across different areas of your life. This leads us into the last piece, which is tips or principles to boost motivation. So this is the last slide I'll be talking about before I hand over to Jade. And one of the tips that we frequently talk about in psychology is to figure out what outcomes you actually value and are committed to. And I would say just thinking about those different domains of life, the, the, the kind that I was just discussing, and thinking about what good things could happen in those domains, both inside of you, intrinsic things that would maybe consist of maintaining good things about your personality, good things about who you are, uh, or gaining new skills, gaining new things that you could use for yourself. And then thinking about things outside of you that you're committed to that need to happen. Thinking about these general outcomes is a good first step. But once you have the outcomes, then the idea is to make them into goals. And so goals, remember, are internal representations. They're mental representations of what a desired state in the future would look like, where something is gained uh, or something negative is lost and gotten rid of. Um, and those things that are gained or lost could be within you or they could be outside of you. And these are your goals, but you would want to write down what is, what is in words representing that state that is achieved. Write these down as goals and you would want to reflect regularly on these outcomes. So on a regular basis, maybe not necessarily every day, but on a periodic basis, you would reflect because the reflection is part of understanding how you're going towards the goal. This implies that you can seek feedback and, and get feedback or information about how you're progressing towards the goal. And with that feedback, then you can make changes to either increase your progress, go faster, or maybe change the progress in some other way. Maybe you're going too fast towards a goal, or maybe you need to allocate your time and energy and resources across multiple goals. So you can make those changes if you reflect across goals as a set or as an array, as a series of goals that are important to you. And consider what you're missing. This is again, uh, going back to the notion of life domains. I think for good mental health, for good physical health, we need to think about our life holistically as a whole. And are we missing things in our life? Is there something you're so committed to that you're missing other things. So I should say in passing that the notion of goals implies that you have this future desired state, 
But goals in themselves will not just happen. You have to be committed to the goal. So the notion of commitment is something that Jade's going to be talking about in more detail. But commitment essentially means how much do you care about that goal happening in the future? And that, that loading of care, that loading of attention, that loading of, of allocating effort towards a goal, we think of that kind of in a summary way as being committed towards the goal. It, it's really important to you. You value it highly. And so that no, notion of valuing something to the point of being willing to sacrifice for it, that's what we talk about as commitment. And that has to be thought of as well across your different life domains and across your goal arrays. So Nick, that's essentially what I wanted to cover. Did you want me to go back and talk about anything else in more detail or would, would you like me to pass on to Jade at this point? I'll pass it on to Jade now. Uh, and thank you, Jade, for joining us today. I look forward to hearing what you have to say as well. All right, thanks, Eric. I'm gonna just jump straight into it and um, speak more as we go through the slides. The girl that decisive, decisively looked better was Jade Emerson, just missing the world record by four one hundredths of a second in the semi-final. She's just here for this 50 breaststroke, had to wait all week, watch all of her friends have success. Jessica Hardy, the American, broke Liesl James's 100 metre world record in the semi-finals of the 100 but she couldn't hold out the great Australian in the final, but she's going to be horribly hard to beat over the 50 metres. And her American teammate who won the US Nationals with Hardy having to be content with second is Tara Kirk in lane number six. This is the one to watch. Noor from China, she's defending champion, loves an outside lane. Going for third world championship this event consecutively. Fukuoka, Barcelona. She's trying to put Montreal with them back to back. And Schaefer from Germany. It's a hot field. It's a chance of a world record. World record holder sitting up in lane one. Edmiston in four. Hansen in three. Hardy in five. The pace will be a cracker. Law will be at seven. Watch her looking for three in a row. 50 breaststroke, away, Edmiston and Hardy came off the blocks together, Hanson fast away, Schaefer at the bottom, Law above her, then Kirk, Hardy, Edmiston, Hanson, Hayward and Baker, let's try and work them out, Edmiston is in front of Hanson by about an arm's length, the Americans are trying to get to a Hardy and Kirk, where's the Chinese, Law is swimming strongly, it looks like Edmiston in the centre of the pool, Hanson's doing well, Law is there, the world record is there to be taken, it's Edmiston going in, got it, she's got the world record, Jade Edmiston has broken the world record, she's taken gold for Australia, gold medal number 11, Brooke Hansen has come third, that's the third world record for Australia, at the 11th. So motivation can be thought of or is known as a reason or reasons for acting or behaving in a particular way. And this is a really common question I get asked when I'm working with swimmers and parents is how did I stay motivated for all of those years? The truth be known, I didn't. There were numerous times where I was tired and felt like I'd reached the point of walking away, particularly through the higher grades of school where the workload increases with homework and assignments and then you add in the mix the social pressures from your friends, it is really quite tough to stay in it. But prior to the age of 15 years, I had a relatively smooth ride in terms of maintaining motivation. From starting my swimming journey at the age of eight years, I only ever swam in the summer season, so from about September, October through to March. In winter, I did other sports, so it kept things new and fresh for me, and I didn't get sick of the same thing. While my pie-in-the-sky pie dream was to make an Australian team one day, I always had little stepping stones that I was striving for, whether it was to break the pool record at my local primary school swim club or to make the district, regional or state team. I always started each season knowing what I was training for. At any time I lost sight of that and drifted into motivational abyss 
It was simply a matter of refocusing and deciding whether those season goals were still important to me. Sometimes that was a self-reflective question and other more challenging times, it was a question my mum would ask me. Something along the lines of, I know you're not feeling great right now, but he was still excited by the thought of achieving your goals. As time passes and your life situation changes, different challenges will show up that can cause a shift in your focus. It could be that you feel like you aren't getting anywhere and your goals seem out of reach. It could be that you're just tired of the daily grind and need a break. Whatever the cause of the perceived lack of motivation, what matters beneath it all is that the goals still spark a fire within. If you ever find yourself questioning your continued involvement in whatever you're chasing, take a moment to ask yourself the following questions. Do you feel you have given everything your best? Do you feel satisfied with what you've achieved to date? Do you feel like you have reached your potential? And are your goals still important to you? I quit at the age of 18 when my life situation led me to a point where I could not attach any positives to continuing. I didn't want to train, compete, achieve, or do anything related to the sport. At that point, I pretty much said, I don't care, and I walked away. Some would say I lost motivation completely. In reality, my motivation simply shifted focus. I was 100% motivated to quit and nothing was gonna stop me. I believe the question is not how do you maintain motivation, but rather, how do you keep it directed towards your goals? A big part of this is making sure your goals are your goals. It's very easy to take on the goals of other people, but for success, they need to be things that you want for yourself, things that spark a fire in your belly, things you are intimately connected with, your passion. When I returned to my sport two years after quitting, I did so with very strong, focused goals. I wanted to be the fastest breaststroker in the world. This was my goal and it belonged to me alone. Absolutely, there were moments where the strength of conviction faded and I questioned myself. In these moments, I took time to reflect and ask those questions we just went through. And each time it helped me to redirect my motivation where it needed to be. So what changed between my swimming goals prior to the age of 18 and then after 20? It was a combination of internal and external motivating factors. Externally, it was changes to the swimming rules. When I quit, it was 18, it was in the year 2000. In swimming, the major meets and training is based around a four year cycle of events. So the Olympics in 2000, 2001 World Champs, 2002 Com Games, and then 2003 World Champs again. So the first World Champs after the Olympics had six new events added to the program to include the 50 metre backstroke, butterfly and breaststroke for men and women. Prior to this, only the 100 and 200 metre events were available similar to the Olympics. Now the 50 metres was always my favourite for a number of reasons. I liked training for the sprint events. I liked going flat out, not having to pace or hold back. Plus it was always what I was best at. And as a kid, this helps fall in love with anything. Having this event added to the World Chance program meant there was an opportunity to train for an event that I loved, to represent Australia and to become the world champion. The internal motivators were relit and at the start of 2002, Two years after completely walking away from the pool, I dived back in to chase my goal, to become the fastest woman in the world for breaststroke. I continued to swim for five years, and while I didn't get to achieve every goal I set, I walked away having smashed the initial goal of being the fastest in the world, when in 2006, I held all possible world level titles, being world champion and world record holder for the short course, and also world champion and world record holder in the long course. It's a proud moment in time I'll carry with me forever. And there's one thing, one main thing that I really learnt from this journey as an athlete. And that is whatever you choose to chase in life, make sure you're running because you want to and not because you have to. You run for yourself in the direction you choose and you will never have a reason to look back. I've now been retired for 10 years and motivation has continued to play an important role in my life. talk to a lot of swimmers and they're quite scarred from that image that's so 
concentrated and, and you're just following this line that goes nowhere. Whereas for me, it feels like home. Going up and down that black line was just absolute freedom. You know exactly where you're going and just focuses you in, keeping you on track. That's what it is for me. Just follow this black line, that's all you have to do is just keep on track and you can't get lost. I was 16 years of age at high school. One of my friends at school took his own life. Prior to that point, I have no memory of having suicidal thoughts or even depressive thoughts. I don't know what it was that, that he had done it that, that I wanted out as well. Not really knowing what to do about that and not feeling comfortable to talk to anyone or, or to get help. I just threw myself into my sport. The dark, suicidal, depressive thoughts slipped to the back of my mind. They were still within me, not an issue at all. And in 2012, my marriage broke down. In 2013, after having a really difficult time finding my feet in life beyond sport, I was diagnosed with bipolar type 2. This was a really difficult challenge that followed with years of medication, hospital stays and every type of therapy available in order to fix what was wrong with me. My motivation for life in general was minimal and at times it didn't exist. I was so far from the person I used to be that I couldn't see a way through. The light bulb moment for me came when I realized there wasn't anything or anyone that could make me better. The solution was within me. It was accepting that this is a part of me, but it doesn't define who I am or how I live. I didn't know who I was or how to live, so I had to start from the beginning and take one step at a time. In sport, we learn to set our sights ahead to where we wanna be. Then we look at where we are right now and create a plan to train and improve one step at a time. I did this so well in my sport that I reached the end. I was world champion, I held world records. One of the biggest challenges I faced during this new phase of my life was being okay, that my end goal looked very different, that my goals became moving from the bed to the couch or having a shower. Those simple daily tasks were huge goals for me and for someone who spent years breaking world records, that was really hard to swallow. And for a long time, I wasn't able to see them as achievements. Instead, I'd beat myself up, making things much worse. There was no motivation. It wasn't anything to be proud of. 
I went through a real internal battle of accepting this new life and finding the light at the end of the tunnel. And I tried over and over, doing well for a while and then crashing down again. Eventually, I was able to fully accept where I was, what it looked like, and I started to essentially study myself, listen to my thoughts, question them, learn about my feelings, emotions, and understand the different situations that would result in positive and negative changes, learning what made me tick, reflecting back on my time as an athlete and not focusing on what was achieved, but the process of how it was done. I was then able to redefine the start and end points in order to get myself from where I was to somewhere better. I've learned so much about motivation over the last 15 years in particular from both sport and life experiences. And there are three key lessons that stand out as being the most important. You cannot be motivated 100% of the time, but you can be committed 100% of the time. It's okay that your level of want or desire goes up and down. I believe this is normal part of the journey, but it's your commitment to the process and the outcome that keeps you in it during those really tough times. Motivation can come from many places and it can also change while you're on the journey. Hold on to whatever drives you forward, but don't be afraid to look for other drivers during the process, especially as life unfolds and changes come your way either through choice or by chance. We can't control everything, but we can choose what to do to it in response. And I believe the greatest achievements come when there is a strong internal passion connected to the outcome. It's this deep down desire that keeps that commitment intact through those most challenging times. It's not the will to win, but the will to prepare to win that creates the success. That's it from me, so thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for that, Eric and Jade. Uh, we'll now start our Q&A session. So if you haven't already done so, now's the time to submit your questions for Eric and Jade by the Q&A button in Zoom. Uh, we'll start from a question from Anonymous, uh, who's wanting to know, what if I'm not the one that needs um, motivation? What if my partner is needing the motivation? What can I do to help? So Eric and Jade, this is open to both of you. Sure. Well. Um that's a that's a difficult area <laughs> i think that jade summed it up well by saying you have to look inside of yourself um, when you're really uh, pushing for change in your life but if it's somebody else and you want them to look inside i guess the question would be how do you get them to look inside of themselves thank you eric jade did you have anything else to add um, yeah, it is a it is a tricky one, but as Eric said, it just does come down to what's within them. So you can ask them um, similar questions and help them to find things that that make them happy, that make them tick, and really get them reflecting internally and and questioning themselves about where it is they want to go, and and then help them come up with that plan. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I think sometimes as partners. And when we're close to people, can just be a sounding point and give them sort of a target or maybe a means to express themselves. Sometimes people have to talk to understand what they're thinking. Does that make sense? Sometimes we can ask them questions and get them talking to reveal, you know, things that provide that support that they said. Um, when I was talking about intrinsic motivation, that's kind of the academic term a bit for what Jake is talking about. Think things that you inside yourself. Great. Uh, we have another question, another uh, anonymous one here. It's, uh, how do I counteract my bad habit of comparing myself to others? Uh, this is why I feel so unmotivated all the time. I think it's, uh, for, for me, it's, it's catching yourself when you're doing it. And then reminding yourself that it's it's about you and it's about your journey. Um, I know I've been guilty of that. I see it a lot in sport, um, especially when kids are going through puberty and there is challenging years where everyone um, has gotten stronger than you and, and you compare yourself to where they're at, what they're achieving, rather than looking at where you're at and knowing that you're on the right path um, and that you are taking the right steps for you. 
um, and that is going to look different to others. So for me, the most important thing would be to catch yourself when you know you're doing it and remind yourself to focus back on you. On you. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Um, um, Nick, I'm just thinking, could you read that question back to us one more time, please? Yeah, no problem. Uh, how do I counteract my bad habit of comparing myself to others? This is why I feel so unmotivated all the time. Okay, that's great. I would just say um, we live in a world that wants us to compare ourselves to others. So from nap plan testing through to job applications, through to performance of work, we're, we're constantly fed this diet of there's a standard out there and you have to meet it. Uh, or you are, are compared to others and you're labeled as a winner, you know, you're at the top of the distribution or you're somewhere in the middle and then you don't mean anything. I, I think it's really important to think about the fact of these kinds of markers of success or the cut scores of su success and think about where those come from. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's quite valid to compare yourself against others. And there's places in life for that, like in the workplace, it might be quite valid that some people are at the top and they perform the best and to compare yourself with those people in that context. But I really think we have to think about life holistically. We have to think about all of life. And there are certain things we do, for example, that are totally within us. And those are ones where you really can look at comparing yourself to who you were a year ago or six months ago or your performance over the last month at the gym. And so the fact is in life, there, there are between comparisons between people, but there's also a lot of things in life where you have to compare within over time. And you really have to remind yourself that, you know, sometimes you feel bad about the between comparisons, but at the same time, you can't just look at the between you and other people. You have to look at within you and how your change is happening and often your significant others your relationships in life people that know you can help you with that and that's very very important that understanding how you are maintaining who you are and increasing your own capacity irregardless of other people that's a very important skill do you have anything more to add no that that was really great answer eric Great. We've got another one come through as well. Uh, it's another anonymous one. Uh, it says, I know how to get motivation and I have motivation, but it's the implementation that I struggle with. What are top tips for implementation? I think it um, comes down to what Eric mentioned about um, the goals. So if you've got the motivation to want to do something, then the next skill set is um, how do you get it, which comes down to, for me, setting the goals. So you've got your different types of goals, the outcome, performance and process goals and, and breaking it down into manageable steps uh, that you do just get up and, and work towards on a daily basis. I think that's excellent. Thank you, Jade. I, 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 the only other thing I would add to that is that some people need cues in different way. And one of my research programs at USQ, we're looking at um, different cues or different marks that people use to remind themselves that they have to go do something. And um, a cue for you may be something like a sticky note you put up on your mirror in the morning or leaving your keys by the front door or putting something out so you see it. Um, Setting an alarm, for example, is a cue to wake up in the morning. So putting cues in your environment can help. And this is where people that we um, know and love, people that live with us, for example, they can help us set up cues to remind us of things that we need to be doing. Um, it's really interesting when you think about it, all the ways you can set up reminders in your environment. Thank you for that. Uh, we've got one final question here. It's um, quite interesting. My my motivation, motivation usually depletes if I fa feel bad about something, example, uh, bad grades. How can I keep my motivation consistent when I'm well and something bad happens out of the blue? How do I keep motivated in those times? Uh, I, I would just add that we teach a course called Motivation and Emotion in Psychology, and not that you all need to go take it. But the point is that motivation and emotion are very, very strongly linked. 
So your, your emotions, in fact, tend to be seen as feedback mechanisms, and, and they tend to be very highly connected to, to your motivation in that emotions can, can, they're like carriers of motivation in a way. It's kind of like when you have a radio wave and people broadcast a song across the radio frequency wave or they speak across that wave, they're carrying something. So your emotions can often carry motivation. Um, your question is a good one because if our emotions are low, it's hard to be motivated to do anything. And our motivations can be low for a lot of reasons. And I guess the best advice I would say is find something that makes you feel good, that is good for you and good for other people, and go try to do that if you can. It's not always easy. But this is why people have hobbies. This is why people have love relationships. We 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 need to find things to draw us to a place where we feel better. And I think at the end of the day, um, it's really important to to have those things, those people in our lives or those things we can do that make us feel better. Um, yeah, from my perspective, uh, one of um, my favorite quotes and still very valid to this day is um, never a fit. Never a failure, always a lesson. Uh, so trying to view your perceived failures as feedback. So what what can I learn from this situation? Um, and then trying to look at it from a balanced perspective. Um, so for example, when I swam a race and didn't quite get the time that I thought or the medal that I was hoping for, I'm obviously going to feel a bit disappointed about that. Um, and that emotion is normal. And it'll, you allow that to be there. But at some point, I have to then look at that race and go, okay, how, how did that race go? Surely there were some things that I actually did execute quite well. And obviously, there's going to be things that I come away and learn from, train and practice and fix for the next time. So it's having that balanced perspective. As an athlete, you have um, your coach there to help you with that as well. Um, in life, same thing. If you, you try something and you fail, or you didn't quite get what you thought, you're going to feel a bit down about that, but when you're, when you're ready and able to look at it as a feedback, what can, what can I do differently in this situation? If you can't see that for yourself, that's when you can ask for friends and family close by to get their perspective and help you see um, those lessons if you can't see them yourself. And similar to what Eric said, that self-care is really important when you're feeling a bit low, um, is to do things that you know help lift your mood and get you to a place where you can then see the feedback from those situations. That's really excellent. I love the way that people can take complex psychological concepts and explain them in ways that are understandable. So what, what Jade's describing is a clinical term called um, cognitive reframing. And so it's looking at things that trouble you and trying to see them in a different way so, they, so you can see good in them. Um, and I think that was a really brilliant way of trying to explain that. So thank you, Jade. That's great. Well, thank you so much for that, Eric and Jade. Uh, that wraps up today's session. Thank you again to Eric and Jade for joining us and sharing your knowledge and to all of you for taking part in today's webinar. Um, just for a reminder that we will be sending through a copy of the presentation slides and recording so that you can revisit the material in your own time. Just wanted to reiterate as well, if you are going through a similar experience to Jade's, we'd like you to know that USQ does have support services available through the health and wellness team. So if you'd like to talk to someone, please reach out. Our next Beyond the Books webinar is all about assessment setbacks and how you can learn from them. Our presenter, Christy Bartlett, will discuss why learning from different types of failure is important and how to pos positively reframe that failure for future success and how to incorporate strategies to cope with any study letdowns you may experience in the future. If you're interested, make sure you register via usq.edu.au slash webinars. We will see you then.